So I am an automation architect uh, and I'm working with InfoStretch since uh, more than eight years. So yeah, so basically InfoStretch is in like uh, Ahmedabad, Pune, and we are also expanding uh, in Bangalore as well. So in these talks, I will cover. Uh, so, so so we develop some uh, QE product, which mainly based on like we do the automation. So we have created some products around automation, and so we have also a product like uh, predictive QA and some AI-based tool. So basically, in this five-minute talk, uh, I will cover uh, so one of our product. It's called Qmetry Automation Studio. So so before I uh, so let me just give you overview of this product through one uh, video file. So. tools will help you achieve that goal. The Geometry Automation Studio, QAS. I mean, this is not so easy. Approach to the software development life cycle for a faster time to market. Today, you need to be more agile and work with various DevOps constructs. Today, you need to run. Doing this is not so easy, especially when you're working with complex enterprise applications, their integrations, with a need to release features quickly. And that's why we have designed a tool specifically for you to tackle these challenges. So now you can focus better on testing and finding bugs, and our quality tools will help you achieve that goal. The Qmetry Automation Studio, QAS, is designed to manage any automation effort seamlessly. Whether it's UI, mobile, web, or web services automation, QAS supports all these with common standards and guidelines for execution. The Automation Studio offers support for open source technologies such as Selenium and Appium. The tool supports an advanced automation strategy to address significant market needs. It is designed for the manual teams making the transition to scriptless automation and it supports automation experts with coded scripts. This tool is designed to support complex mobile conditioning scenarios like barcode scanning, touch ID, location spoofing and more. It offers an extensive authoring support with BDD keyword, and code-driven approaches to offer an improved automation experience. Today, you need to support a sophisticated device world with a multitude of test cases, scenarios, and scripts for these variations. The Test Automation Studio aims to solve this problem with its built-in objective spy built for iOS and Android to test and analyze any application with a single click. The fundamentals of test authoring are changing to accommodate natural language for ease. This enables the product and business analyst teams to pitch in and author test cases and manage their projects easily. The Qmetry Test Automation Studio has made BDD and TDD as the de facto standard with its content assist and step viewer to enable better communication across teams. The omnichannel digital enterprise demands a lot and QAS is the Swiss army knife you need to ensure scalability and comprehensive coverage for your application. The studio brings out-of-the-box scalability containers and leverages the cloud to provide the right CI integration with mobile conditioning libraries and many other modules. No automation effort is complete without the right coverage and analytics. QAS offers a detailed dashboard that showcases all the results of your automation initiatives filtered by various types of attributes. The Automation Studio is designed for DevOps and the same scripts can be used by developers, automation engineers, and operation leads, enabling seamless DevOps outcomes. Simplify your automation efforts with the Qmetry Automation Studio. Quickly learn and start your new automation project. Talk with us now. Yeah, so so basically this queue is, so now you got the idea, right? So basically it's an uh, automation tool. Yeah, 
So Qmetry Automation Studio is basically an automation tool, right? So where like uh, you can create a uniform script that can be worked on the different platforms like the web, mobile, uh, and the, the cloud base also, right? So let me just quickly go through with the product itself. So, so I have this, uh, uh, the product installed in my machine. So you can easily create, give you all the basic capabilities like create new project and uh, so, so as I said, like it's a, like a uniform way, right? So, you, so all your resources like object locators, your script, your implementation, right? It does support like uh, different techniques to author your test script and all, right? If you see in my video, right? So we do support like BDD, keyword driven, test driven, right? So based on your choice, you can write your script in any like BDD and all, right? So. So let's say, let me just open quickly one BDD scenario. So, and it, so we have like an inbuilt uh, capability for test data manager also, right? So every test need a valid test data, right? So that test data, so this studio can consume in any other format like uh, JSON, XML, or uh, TXT. You can put your test data uh, in the, the external source. So this BDD scenario, so here you can see, right? So for this particular searching, flight with the data, right? So this the data I can create in the, uh, under the resources. And uh, the similar way, like uh, it's very easy to create a new automation script. So we are offering like uh, some uh, inbuilt steps, right? So it's very easy, like very quickly you can create your test. So, so if you see here, like you can uh, use the different uh, checkpoints for assessment, verification. So it also does support like web service. So you just need to define your web service uh, request in form of tabula and it, it will automatically generate the test case and uh, it's a very easy to uh, create a test for mobile web as well as API, okay? And uh, so it's also has like inbuilt uh, automation framework also, okay? So, so when I say automation framework, right? So it's, uh, so there are like a different concept like we have, implemented in this like we can create a component so the, so component means like uh, so let's say in my application there are some components which is uh, having like a common characteristic right so i just need to create uh, one element for that component and that i can reuse in the different pages also right so it will reduce lots of your time uh, in terms of uh, implementing your automation right so let's say if i open this calendar right so it's a most common example so let's say in every application, the calendar component can be used in the different pages and all, right? So in normal traditional automation, we generally write the locators for each and every elements and all. So by using this framework, like it's very easy, you just need to extend, it's a Java-based framework. So you, you can just quickly extend with the, the web component and describe your, uh, the component characteristic uh, by using some annotation, right? And then I can use this component uh, in any application or any page. Okay. So we also, so for regarding, so it's a leveraging like Selenium and APM. So we can use all the Selenium and uh, APM capability uh, through this. So as well as like we have created uh, the mobile library also that can help you to solve uh, the complex mobile uh, scenarios as well like barcode and if I want to automate the scenario like uh, deposit a check, right? So it has like an inbuilt library also. So by using this common BDD steps, we can perform uh, such automation also. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone. Okay, great. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Mitri Vinik. Um, to, to actually clarify one thing, I live in Canada, so the topic and the talk uh, that I'll present will be probably a bit different for you guys. So the stress-driven development. Basically here I'll try to tackle the problem of stress we have at work as developers and uh, how I'm personally trying to tackle it and you know, continue my work in a creative and innovative way. So as I mentioned, there is a problem right now, stress that we have at work. And that stress basically arises from the fact that nowadays office becomes our life, uh, especially in the States where they try to make an office as you know, appealing as possible, where they serve you lunches, they build like those fancy rooms where you can uh, play games all, all day. So they really try to attract you and basically stay in the office. So in the, as, a, as a result, you don't really separate life 
and work as much. And it's very difficult for us as engineers because hopefully we enjoy what we're doing. So you say, oh, as a developer, I work extra, but I love what I do, so there is no problem. I would actually say there is still that problem of continuously working for your employer. There's also stress that might arise from the fact that you might be a consultant, uh, and the consultants usually work 24-7. Or you maintain legacy systems that also add some stress because you can't be innovative when you work in legacy systems as much as you would like to. And so the way I try to tackle that stress is by um, something, like obviously you guys, um, something that people really try these days, especially in North America, it's some sort of meditation. Or there is an app that's called Headspace, which I found nice introduction to just the breathing techniques that uh, help you, you know, start your day in the morning, 15 minutes, sitting in silence, and really get yourself together before you go to work. It really helps you to kind of click, like, click, clean yourself before you go into that, you know, daily routine. It's daily routine that's usually adds the stress to your work. So another thing I've tried before is the flow therapy. It's also a great thing to try because what it does to you is basically it's the noise and the sense isolation capsule. So you don't hear anything, you don't see anything, and you lay in the salt water for like 90 minutes. The whole thing nowadays is that we have so much noise pollution, light pollution, and this kind of you know, isolation for a short period of time really helps you to remove the stress. And all this, the reason why I even talk about it is as soon as you get rid of that, that daily stress, you can actually be more creative, innovative, and productive. You know, studies shown that 40 hours a week, or even like 100 hours a week that some people try to do, uh, it's not going to help you to deliver a better product. Yes, you might deliver a product faster, but again, the, the hidden cost of any software is in maintenance. Hence, when you're delivering a software fast with a stress in mind and just pushing yourself as hard as you can to have something on the market, you're probably not thinking as much or as well as you would uh, about the architecture and how to actually write this software in a maintenance, in an easy to maintain way. So if you actually get rid of the stress, again, you will be able to write that software much better. If you're a lead or a manager, you really have to encourage your employees or your co colleagues to kind of get rid of the stress. Um, the good thing I've noticed myself, because I have a lead position, is to lead by example. So really try you know, yourself, take days off. That's a big problem I've noticed, especially in America, where a thing called unlimited PTO, pay, uh, pay time off, is a thing where they don't have a set number of days for you to take uh, as a vacation. You choose when to take a vacation. As a result, people you often don't take any days off at all. And it, again, adds to the stress. You have to take time off. Speaking at the conferences and traveling is also a great way to you know, get rid of the stress. Uh, that's what I found for me very useful. Read a book. It's also a good way to, especially a non-technical book, it helps you to kind of broaden your horizons. And you know, to finish my talk, what I like to usually uh, say at the end is, yes, life is short. You, you can do very little things to prolong your life. But it's up to you to choose how wide your life would be. So really, do all those things I've mentioned. Find your own ways to get, you know, work, um, work with the stress and get rid of it. And uh, maybe you know, share your, your uh, tips with me. I would be very interested uh, to hear from you guys. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. So I'm Megha. Uh, I work with S&P Global. Uh, I'm a test engineer there. And I want to take this opportunity to discuss a Selenium grid uh, cloud automation solution we built uh, to overcome a problem that uh, basically entailed having to run, as you can see, around 1,200, 1,300 test cases every time there was a major build. And these were all UI test cases uh, to be run on browsers, uh, and the underlying, uh, uh, the tools that we're using uh, uh, is Selenium, uh, Java, our own uh, test automation framework that we built uh, in-house. In so uh, earlier, uh, a year back, we were uh, running all these cases uh, on an on-prem Selenium grid, which basically consisted of a powerful Windows machine uh, acting as the hub, and to which were connected a variety of uh, 
Windows VMs, uh, few Linux VMs. And we were basically uh, sending all our 1,300 test cases to this hub to be sent over to all these connected nodes. Now, um, as you can imagine, uh, as test automation engineers, we already have our code base to maintain. On top of that, you add the infrastructure uh, that also needs maintenance, upgrades, hardware upgrades, you know, all these changes from time to time. So as a solution to that, as a workaround to that, and there was also the problem of, uh, you know, limited hardware. Having to run all these test cases, uh, we were uh, limited in the sense that we had 20, 30 VMs to run these on. And, uh, you know, once the load actually increases, uh, the CPU and memory uh, usage spikes, your tests slow down. There's nothing wrong with the application, but the tests slow down. So the next step we took was to dockerize our framework, uh, run the test cases uh, in uh, Docker images, customized Docker images. So <clears throat> that helped us to quite an extent. Uh, there was uh, less maintenance headache because Docker, right? And uh, <clears throat> every time the load uh, went up, uh, Docker was zippy, it was fast, it's any day lighter than, uh, you know, having to run on a VM. So <clears throat> that was that. But even then, we were heavily limited in the sense uh, that the infrastructure uh, on-prem was still not able to facilitate, was not able to uh, handle all that load. So we decided to host our grid uh, in cloud. And for that, we did a lot of uh, POC. We started from the very basic that, you know, we are going to spin up EC2 instances in AWS cloud. So uh, we began from there. We started doing our POCs. Uh, then we thought about ECS. Then uh, Fargate was uh, launched around the same time. We started uh, thinking about, you know, hosting on Fargate. So I'm going to talk very quickly about that. But uh, before that, I just want to launch uh, our containers on cloud. So as you can see, right now it's a 503. So we have a Jenkins job, which basically upgrades uh, the Fargate services, uh, which are basically three in number, one service for the hub, uh, one service for Firefox having, as you can see, 15 containers, and one service for Chrome uh, having five. Because most of our test cases uh, are, you know, meant for uh, our uh, supposed to be running on Firefox. So I'm hoping in less than two minutes, the grid should be up. Yeah, so I was talking about uh, the limitations we were facing with the uh, on-prem, uh, uh, you know, hardware. Uh, every time that number of test cases would increase or uh, you know, we have to run the same test cases multiple times. The infrastructure would completely give up. There was cache getting created. There was a lot of maintenance headache. Uh, <clears throat> so we wanted to get uh, rid of all that. So uh, we thought of using Selenium. Uh, uh, we thought of using AWS Fargate. Now, Fargate is the AWS solution for running your Docker containers. Uh, some of you who may have worked on ECS, you may be wondering, how is Fargate any different from ECS? Uh, in ECS, you have to spin up your own EC2 instances, which are nothing but ECS agents. You have to spin them up. You have to maintain them. If there are patches required, anything maintenance related required, the effort still goes there. Fargate is one step better in the sense that there is no maintenance. You don't have to uh, you know, spin up your machines with a particular uh, configuration of CPU and memory, and you don't have to build your own AMIs. Uh, you don't have to look after them. Fargate will do the job on the fly for you. It will create those instances. You just have to, you know, uh, be very particular about what configuration you want. Uh, if it's taking time, it's a good sign. While it loads, I'll also touch upon another aspect of Fargate, uh, that you are charged for uh, the amount of time that you're running your uh, test cases, right? Uh, and uh, you're charged by the second. 
So if your test cases, uh, right now our test cases take anywhere between 50 to 60 minutes. With this, we have cut down the time uh, by one fourth uh, right now. So uh, as long as we need the instances, we keep them alive. Uh, once we are done with them, we shut down the services. And uh, like in a day, we are using it for barely 15 to 30 minutes. And we are charged only for that. If the demo is done. Uh, it could be because, uh, you know, of the internet. And uh, the last thing, uh, it won't start right now. Uh, I don't suppose it would. But the last thing is uh, there's also auto scaling involved. So uh, suppose a request comes in for, uh, you know, running the same batch of cases uh, simultaneously on different environments, you know. Uh, the load has doubled. So there's auto scaling logic also involved, which will add uh, your predefined number of uh, containers uh, to the grid, uh, and uh, that will happen when the CPU and the memory usage uh, uh, spikes, it starts touching 80%. So AWS will automatically detect that usage, add the containers so that uh, your tests are not skipping, uh, they don't uh, die down due to lack of containers, and uh, basically they're not in queue for a long time. How much time do I have? <laughs> Sorry guys, I lucked out today. <laughs> There's no internet. Uh, I mean, the internet is uh, not on my side. So uh, if you're interested in uh, the solution or you're looking for something similar, uh, just uh, let me know. We can talk about it offline. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Sridhar. I'm, uh, I'm working as a QA in ThoughtWorks Technologies. Okay, so today, whole day, we have spoken about mobile in one of the tracks. So I'll just quickly show you how to inspect an element on one of the mobile apps. Has anyone used it before? Has anyone tried this? Inspecting an element on mobile apps, Android or iOS? Yeah. So yeah, I will quickly start in the interest of time. So I'm, I'm using a tool called APM Desktop. So after this, I will just quickly share an experience. Like we had a specific problem, and like how did we overcome that? I'll just quickly share it after this. So I'm just starting the server. You can see it, right? Okay. So first, I will show how to how to do an iOS one. So these are the basic desired capabilities which we have. So what's the desired capability? Can anyone do it? So yeah. So we know APM is a client server thing, right? So client server application. So the capability is the one which says. So for any client server application, we need a session. So the desired capabilities is the one which the client says to a server, like I want this type of session with the server. Right? So that's the in basic terms, that's the desired capability. So in here, I have added a few basic ones. Where's the app path? So the app path is again for simulators, it should be a zip file or a app file. If it's an iOS real device, then it should be a IPA file. Okay. Uh, so platform name, automation name, and device name, so version and also UDID. So I should I need a UDID of a simulator because I don't have any real devices connected. So I will say just instruments, instruments hyphen is devices. This will give me uh, the list of simulators available on my box. I will just select one. Yeah, so UDID is equal to this one. So this will shot me an app which is in that path, the zip which I have saved there. So this works, the APM desktop works with both uh, iOS and Android. Yeah, so this started, booted me a simulator and it's launching the app. Okay, so this is the app and it will launch me the inspector here. So this launched me the inspector. So in here I can just select on this, like similarly how we inspect the web elements, similarly we have to do it here, right? So if I see here, I can see the label as username, name as username, value as admin, like all these things I can get. And I can just use the APM 
like find by iOS, find by Android, find by, and I can just select this element and I can do the actions on it. Right? Make sense? So this is how we do it for iOS. So for Android, we can do it using the same tool, uh, using APM desktop. But let's explore something something different. So Android SDK provides something called UI Automator Viewer. So this uh, this one ships along with the Android SDK. So we can use that to uh, inspect the elements on an Android application. So I will just go to. So this used to be there in Android Home, but with the latest version, they have moved it to Bin Tools. So this is the Android Automator Viewer. So if I just click on this, so I have an Android simulator open here. So in Android, there is no difference between a simulator or a, a real device. It's just the ADB command which works for both. So this one will get me uh, the current uh, snapshot. So if I have if I have to select something, if it's uh, some, some app which is open, then I can just get the uh, so if this is an app, so it gives me the package name, content description. So content description is nothing but the Android uh, find by, like I will just quickly explain that later. Uh, so this gives me all these details. So we can inspect the element using this tool and we can just perform the actions on it. Okay? Yeah. So this is what I wanted to show on the APM desktop. So uh, one more thing is like we had a, uh, like currently I'm working in a, uh, with a client. Uh, which has web web application and also the Android and iOS web, uh, web uh, Android and iOS native applications. Uh, yeah, well, one minute I'll I'll finish. So yeah, I'll quickly show. Uh, okay. So in the web application and the native application, the flows are almost the same, except some customized like my account kind of application, my my account kind of pages. So what we did was uh, like using APM, we can find like you can see here. Uh, say like there is a single uh, mobile element which I can find it for web, also for Android, and also for iOS. So using the APM field decorators, and also multiple strategies are available to find the uh, allocators here. So like we did this, and also say there is something to say. I would say like we have to read an alert. We have to read an alert. So the way we read it, uh, read an alert in iOS is very different from Android and also in the web. So how how we did that was like we added an interface which provides the runtime polymorphism. Uh, so if it's an Android driver, then do it in a different way, like use a different application, like as a, use a different element for it. If it's iOS, then use a different thing. So like this, we solved uh, that problem. Yeah, thanks for, for, for this opportunity. Tested firsthand, and some of it that I haven't tested firsthand. But I just want to share some stories. Some, uh, the first item I'd like to mention is Aspire. So following on from Dimitri's uh, talk on stress-driven development, Aspire is a wearable device that monitors your breathing. So you can monitor your stress and whatnot. Um, I actually have two of these devices. I would normally bring them around to, to demo, but I didn't pack it today um, as I came here. Um, it's, a, it's an app. Uh, you can see your breathing in real time as well. Uh, this device connects over Bluetooth with your phone. You can either wear it on your waist pocket or you can wear it on your bra strap. I'm looking around. I don't think there's uh, a large amount of the audience wearing bra straps here. Um, I don't know. You could all be wearing bras under, underneath. I'm not judging. No judgment here. Hashtag. <laughs> um, it can give you notifications when you're tense. Uh, I don't know if this might cause more tension for some people, <laughs> um, but I found it useful. There's been like one or two situations where I'd been like in a doctor's theater uh, surgery and I had this little device vibrate against my skin to tell me I was stressed. And unfortunately, I was in a situation where I couldn't uh, get out of that stressful relationship. I imagine if I wore it here in Bangalore, it'd be buzzing every time I walked into traffic probably. Um, it can give you stats over the day. For example, uh, how, how many minutes you were calm for the day, uh, how many times you were focused, uh, how much tension you had during the day, uh, your activity, 
your number of steps. I think nearly every wearable these days can monitor your step count and how long you've been seating as well. So you can and monitor more other elements of your health if you like. Uh, why did I stop using it? I found when I wore it on my bra, it would actually vibrate, um, rub against the skin and cause discoloring. Uh, so that wasn't all that great. Um, I, I moved as well and uh, misplaced the charger. I think the, the I ended up getting a replacement. Um, it also wasn't working very well with um, Android um, Oreo at the time uh, because it was Oreo had just been released. Um, so it's one of those things that I've I've used once or twice, at least for a month or two, and I really enjoyed using it. But it's one of those things you buy once and use for a bit and then get out of practice. Um, I would like to practice more mindfulness techniques, so I might recharge my Spire and start doing it again at some point. Um, but that might be one uh, combat to the, the stress-driven de development. Uh, monitor how much you get stressed dur during the day. Um, uh, another device uh, is the Android Wear. Uh, when I was a contractor at Google, um, they gave me an Android Wear device to help with testing. Um, so I wouldn't have gone out of my way to buy it myself. Um, but they gave me one to test with. Um, I didn't like it. It was annoying. Um, <laughs> there's a reason why I, I, I hardly used it. Has anyone used a, a wearable watch before? Hands up. Are you keep your hand up if you're still using it. Yeah, that's, that's actually not too bad. That's better than I expected. I'd like to experiment more with um, wearable uh, app development at some point, but I, I wasn't super impressed with the, that. Um, something slightly related, it's not really wearables, but um, I was experimenting with using the Nike Run app to monitor my running. Um, it uses a lot of similar technology with what you'd use wearables for. They are, there are watches and whatnot for this. Um, the reason why I stopped using the Nike Run app was I broke my ankle about seven months ago. Um, you don't really do much running with a broken ankle. Um, but I would like to get back into it. I, I liked a lot of the data it showed. It was all free. Um, you can, um, they had training programs you could um, sign up for. They had this uh, uh, every Sunday that have a, a 5K challenge where they would tell you how many people were doing a 5K challenge. Um, and it would kind of motivate you to just go out and run for 5Ks. Uh, and it was nice to see improvements over time, gamifying some of those stats. Uh, PeriFit um, is uh, for women's uh, health. Uh, it is a device that you wear on the inside. Um, so guys, you can't really test this one out all that easily. Um, it's uh, used for... Uh, uh, what's it used for? It is used for pelvic floor strengthening. So you wear it and you squeeze the muscles and you see this butterfly go up and down and you're supposed to collect little flowers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is that, am I at five? Okay. Um, <laughs> that, I, 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 if you're an all-male dev team, I think it might be a little challenging to, to test this in person. Um, uh, but uh, if you do overcome those challenges, let me know. Um, but thank you. The problem we were dealing with was innovation. And like function innovation is equals to, so I want to write this because this is something is the key for like what we figured out is function innovation is equals to the organization that people you have into architecture, the architecture that you put them into. Uh, Keep our mechanisms into culture, right? The biggest pain point here was nobody wanted to write tests. No, not a single engineer wanted to write tests. But there are a set of engineers who really wanted to write tests. And those are all engineers who had worked in open source. And we saw people who actually contribute in open source, they really understand the value of tests and like craftsmanship of writing code. So then we started asking everybody to contribute in open source. And suddenly everybody realizing, started realizing Okay, probably, yes, it's good to write tests, right? <laughs> Mechanisms. Like, when you give people processes, simple processes, they understand, they, when they do it multiple times, they understand the value of them. So we, we had no processes. So we started putting a lot of processes like Scrum, test driven development, retrospections. All of that kind of led to one answer, that we need to stop wasting time 
like releasing stuff. We just write small code, right? And we just test so many sh things across multiple platforms. Uh, that, and then we move to an architecture which is pods. Essentially, each pod has a prod manager, a designer, a set of engineers, and they own a problem autonomously. They can do whatever the fuck they want to do to solve that problem. And they can take n, n number of months to solve that. But the problem is your components are not like this. Your components are shared. So how do you solve that? So that's where, like, looking at this and this, we kind of created a team called CD slash CI, and we looked at our architecture as any time we need to solve a problem, we need to create a different pod which productizes a problem. Like, for example, we productized infra at point of time. We now have productized continuous delivery and integration. We have productized writing tests. We've built in-house frameworks so that anybody can write tests very easily. We have built frameworks so that everybody can manage their components and still make staging available for everybody. But it was not simple. I think if you guys want to bring that change, focus on culture. If you kind of make people, make engineers see uh, and contribute in open source, that would be a big leverage point. So I hope this kind of helps. Thank you.